this is the second part of the law of fruitfulness remain blessed as you listen to this utterance by apostle michael orupo the law of fruitfulness part two of god and in this conference of fruitfulness my body is to help you understand the principles that makes for fruitfulness praise god if you do that in and out of season you will be fruitful you would manifest god and you would have dominion i began last night by sharing from genesis chapter 1 verse 28 the bible said after god created the man he said he blessed them and he said be fruitful he said multiply he said replenish he said subdue and he said have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and so if you are operating in the blessing the first sign that you are blessed is fruitfulness if you find a man who is blessed the first sign you will notice is that anything he touches prospers because the word blessed means empowered to prosper and if you begin to prosper the first sign is that you begin to be fruitful and when a man truly is blessed and he has grown in the blessing he now enters dominion so it's not enough to just be fruitful it's enough to have dominion to have sufficient influence where you can impose the government of god over a context so when you come to a place you don't just get blessed by reason of where you are you enforce god's will in that place and so you determine how things run there that's the sign that you are truly fruitful because the completion of the cycle of fruitfulness is dominion if a man has reached dominion then that man is fruitful indeed and i told us we were created and designed to be this way that is the nature of our design that's why after god created us he gave the commandment to be fruitful and to have dominion because he created us we cannot but be like that i told you yesterday that when we were created if we were created to be like angels and archangels that would have been glorious enough because there are many spectacular angels that the bible speaks of and is replete in scripture there are angels that men saw and fainted there are angels that in one night killed 185,000 soldiers there's an angel that the Bible said came into the earth. One of his foot covered the whole land, another covered the whole sea. When he shouted, one third of all the birds died. That's the majesty that the angelic order commands. And so if God created us as an archangel or as archangels, that would have been glorious. But he went beyond the angelic order and he decided to create us like himself. Now in creating us like himself, if he created us like the sun, that would have been glorious if he created us like the spirit that would have been glorious if he created us like the father that would have been glorious but when he created us he made us a summation of the godhead he said let us make man in our so man was created as a reflection of the totality of the divine so we carry a dimension of the world we carry a dimension of the spirit and we carry a dimension of the father so we cannot but have dominion dominion is our birthright is part of the creation order and so a christian must understand this because if he doesn't he will be living a life below what god has in view and if you get to heaven you must know because every one of us will be shown the fullness of our potential when we arrive there and so whether you will be happy or disappointed is dependent on what you do now that you're on earth this is why you cannot afford to live carelessly it's not enough to be saved it's enough when kingdom comes through you so beyond being saved your life must command kingdom that's what makes your existence worthwhile but this is not a gift if it were a gift everyone would walk in it this is something you deliberately work on you grow in it if it were a gift, all of us here would be dominating. I mean, if all of us here were working in the fullness of our potential, Nigeria would be too small for us. 
Only 12 disciples turned their walls upside down. So this is something you are deliberate about. This is something you work on and this is something you become. And so yesterday I showed us that the first thing we must understand about fruitfulness is that we capacities must be developed. Because the Bible said, although we have the potential of dominion because God commanded it into our spirit, but we must be willing and obedient. Isaiah 1.19 says, if you are willing and obedient, that's when you will eat of the good of the land. That's when you become productive. That's when you have dominion. And you cannot be obedient to nothing. You are obedient to a set of rules. You are obedient to lay down patterns. You are obedient to structures that are established. And I said the first thing you must know is that there are laws that govern fruitfulness. However, before we speak about that law, there is a need for capacity building. Because if you are small, no matter how fruitful you are, your fruitfulness will be small. The prosperity of an ant is not significant in the world of elephants. So size matters in this thing. So first of all, you have to be enlarged. Your capacity must be increased first. And I showed us six areas of capacity enlargement yesterday. And that's also a law. It's the law of value in the equation of fruitfulness. I said the first aspect of capacity building is in the mind, the realm of visualization. Many persons are small, not because they don't have, but because the boundary of their imagination is too small. Even if God appears to you today, you cannot become anything until you can see it. That's why in Genesis 12 from verse 1 to 3, he told Abraham, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. Indeed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham was still walking, following his father, trying to survive. Until Genesis 13, 14, God brought him out and said, look up. See, anything you see is yours. And God still emphasized it in Genesis 15, 5 to 6. He said, look at the stars. If you can number them, that's how your children will be. It was at that point that he believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. So if you can't see, you cannot become. So anybody who wants to be fruitful must become deliberate about enlarging his imagination. The difference between the poor and the rich is imagination and the fortitude to follow through. A poor man's mind is full of nonsense. He wants to sleep from morning to night. He wants to just relax. It's fantasies that dominate his mind. But when you enter the mind of the wealthy, they are thinking of how to solve problems. They are thinking of how to impart humanity. And the moment an idea pops up, they live to fulfill that idea. This is the difference between the poor and the rich. And if we want to be fruitful, we must invest here. Invest here. Invest Spend time to invest here. If you build here, your world will become big. That's the first area of capacity building. I said the second area of capacity building is in the area of abiding. Every one of us reflect God. And so the extent to which we stay with God is the degree to which we will reflect Him. This is why every Christian must build the capacity to stay with God. For some of us, our bandwidth of abiding is five minutes. You can't power a generation with five minutes abiding. You can't pick anything from there. Even your phone takes hours to charge. The phone that you use, unless you are small, is a touch light phone. Even touch light phones take 20 to 30 minutes to charge. If you are using an Android, Android phone, sometimes it takes hours. So you need to spend time with God. There are inspirations downloading. Wisdom is downloading. Favor is downloading. Influence is downloading. Stop cutting downloads over your life. The Holy Ghost is putting something. It's at 30% you have worked out. And so you keep having this idea that something will become, something will happen. And it never happens because the installation is never complete. And so one area you must build capacity is in the area of abiding. I told you yesterday, there's nothing wrong in sleeping in God's presence. If you are tired, sleep there. When you wake up, continue. Because even while you are sleeping, God can be walking. The Bible says, why men slept? The enemy came and sowed in the field. So if enemies can sow while you are sleeping, God can do much more. After all, Eve came out of Adam when he was sleeping. Sleep there. But by all means, increase your capacity in abiding. The third area of capacity building I spoke about is in the area of humility. See, discipline yourself, teach yourself, train yourself to be humble. If there are practices you need to imbibe to force you into humility, imbibe it. 
at the end of the day, the extent to which you can be exalted is tied to the degree of your humility. It's not the devil that will fight you in this case. It's God. He said, God resists the proud, but he giveth more grace, more ability to the humble. And so if you will build capacity, please, by all means, build capacity in the area of humility. So the psalmist was speaking, he said, a contrite heart and a broken spirit, thou, O Lord, cannot despise. The guy knew something about God. The moment a man becomes humble, God can resist that man. And the Bible said in Numbers 12, 3, Moses was great because he was the meekest of all men on earth. See, this generation is scaringly and arrogant. The little thing God is doing with you in one corner, you now assume that's the zenith of God. We must be careful because there's too much in God that we have not accessed. And the key to accessing it is in our humility. Listen, be humble. It won't take anything from you. Most times, those who try to operate like peacocks are the ones who have nothing. Those who are big don't care because they know you can't intimidate them. They know you can't, you can't undermine them. Their impact is too loud for you to silence them. So while they are quiet, their impact is shouting. That's why you don't need it. Let's, let's be calm. We need it for where we are going to. <laughs> Humility is capacity. I'm telling you, this is one of the biggest capacity you can build in your life. To be humble. In the midst of circumstances where you are tempted to prove a point, you can tame yourself and say, no, there's no cause for alarm. It's high level capacity. Anybody can shout. Anybody can talk. Anybody can boast. But when you see those who are men, they keep quiet. Because if they speak, they will intimidate you. So in order to help you to be comfortable around them, they try to be simple. <laughs> Have you not seen some of these really wealthy guys? They show up and they show up very calm and casual. Because if, if they try to, they will, you, will, you can't survive around them. So they want you to breathe. So they will calm down. <laughs> they will calm down. Some of them will be calm and then you shake them and be talking. When you are moving, then they'll say, Is that person who you will not become afraid? That's why they were humble around you. Because if you knew you won't be comfortable. <laughs> so if you are humble, it's capacity for fruitfulness. And then I said we must build capacity for gratitude. Don't nothing is small. If somebody gives you a lift, it's a big deal. If somebody gives you breakfast, it's a big deal. If somebody allows you to pass before he passes, it's a big deal. Train yourself to always be grateful and show it by thankfulness. Don't say, oh, that little help you offered me. There's no help that is little. If you know the frustration people are going through because they don't have little helps, and no matter how little it is, if it is aggregated, it's something. As small as 1,000 is, if 100 people give you 1,000, it's 100,000. So nothing is small. If you want more, you must be thankful. In Jeremiah 30 verse 19, it says, Out of them shall proceed the voice of thanksgiving, and from them the voice of melody. And it said, I will multiply them. They will not be few. I will glorify them. They will not be small. So it is their thanksgiving that orchestrates abundance. The reason many people are small and they are not productive and fruitful is because they are too ungrateful to be helped. It's a risk to help an ungrateful man. It's a big risk. Because the day he becomes powerful, his assignment will be to destroy you. Because you are the only person he wants to compete with. You are the only person an ungrateful person wants to compete with. The moment he's lifted, he wants to show you that he's something. And that's when you, you will be shocked that the 1,000 help you offered him, he will remember it. It was the one day you offended him. That's the one he will remember. And that one offense, he will amplify it to destroy you. It's a risk to help an ungrateful person. And even God knows it. So when God wants to bless a man, he checks the level and the scope of his thanksgiving. If you build capacity in the area of thanksgiving, you have indeed built capacity. And I also spoke to us yesterday. I said, we must build capacity in the area of giving. Proverbs 11.25, it said, the liberal soul 
shall be made fat. He said, him that watereth shall by himself be watered unto. In verse 24 of that scripture, he said, there is one that withholds more than is needful and turns to penury. So when you keep what you should give, you are in trouble. He said, God giveth seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Sowing comes before eating. Many people gather everything for themselves. That's why their world is all about them. And you are very small if your life is all about you. You must learn to scatter. You must learn to give. He said, give a portion to seven. Give a portion to eight. You know not the evil that comes upon the earth. He said, in the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, withhold not thy hand. The principle of God for enlargement is liberality. And I told you yesterday, some people are so stingy that even to God, they can't give. And so the reason you find all the argument, why must we give? Why must we tithe? It's not because of pastors. I know there are pastors who have bastardized this. But most times it's because of stinginess. Because the givers never argue. Those who argue all the time are those who never give. And so they want to discourage others from giving so that they will be comfortable in their non-giving posture. But for you, let nobody discourage you from giving. Give and give and keep giving and give more. Because that's God's, that's God's principle. That's the way God operates. God had only Jesus and he gave him. So when you hear the gospel, let it impart on you. Not just in receiving from God, but in also teaching you to become like God. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the only one he had, he gave him for us. So we too must develop the capacity to become givers. If we look like God, we must give. Give to God, give to those around you, give to those who have need, and keep giving. Don't be weary in well doing, says the word of God. Hallelujah. These are five major areas of capacity building, and these are value systems that makes for fruitfulness. Because when you are dealing with fruitfulness, like I said, there are laws that control it. And the first law for fruitfulness is the law of values. If you don't have values, you will never be fruitful. In fact, trust and relationship runs on the frequency of values. Most times, the little thing you need to become productive is tied to another man. But that man won't help you because you are ungrateful. Most times, your next level is with somebody who sees you every day. But he will not remember to help you because you are not humble. So if you want to be fruitful, you must make sure you build values. Values are virtues that makes you stand out. And the moment those virtues begin to beam out of you, even kings will come to you. He said, Gentiles will come to your light. He said, Kings will come to the brightness of your rising. And no king is empty handed. When kings show up, they show up with abundance. And so when you want to be fruitful, please be careful. Know that fruitfulness is a function of value. If you study and look around you today, some of the most powerful men are the most humble men, they are the most generous men. They are the most kind of men, kindest men because they know that there's something about value that is connected to fruitfulness. This is why they are deliberate about it. They are deliberate. Value produces fruitfulness. And because I've spoken about capacity, I won't over buttress that. Now, after this, the second law that commands fruitfulness is the law of understanding. Believe me, if you don't know something, you won't be fruitful. You must know something. No matter how you fast, no matter the name you bear, they won't bring you into the, the, the aeronautics space if you don't know anything about planes. They will not bring you into agriculture if you don't know anything about harvesting and planting. So there is, the understanding is a must if you must be fruitful. See, the problem with many people is that they make religion out of everything about life. So somebody comes to work, he doesn't know anything about it. In the morning, he prays in tongues very loud to let the office know that a servant of Jesus Christ is here. And then after he's done praying, there's nothing wrong with praying. But when you are done praying, what do you understand about the files? What do you understand about the case study? You are a doctor, you forget scissors in somebody's stomach. Meanwhile, you are the one telling the whole hospital to fast. So there's a problem. We don't know. We are not masters of what we do. If you want to be fruitful, you must be the best at what you are doing. If you don't master it, 
you can never be fruitful because this world responds to what you know the way the system is designed see if no matter how you love your brother eh, if you are doing something you won't involve him because you love him i'm running a ministry now i won't invite my cousin to come and preach because i love him no he must know something he must have value to offer he must have understanding because if he carries the microphone he can begin with someone by saying thank you my brother i love you but that's not what people came to hear people came to hear deep things about god to change their lives so if he doesn't have it he will sit by my side he will never be on the altar the problem we have is that we think the world will open to us out of sentiment nobody has that time too many people are dying too many people are in pain for you not to have understanding to think you have a place even god will not promote you this is the problem we have that many christians are not fruitful and they are blaming god and blaming everybody they will tell you they did this they did that but what do you know that's the question you will leave this meeting this morning and ask yourself of the truth i know god wants me to be a doctor I know God wants me to be a prophet. I know God wants me to be an apostle. I know God wants me to be a mystery. But what do I know about this field? To be honest, you set the question and write the exam if you will pass. And then check what those who are making impact are doing in that your field. Can you stand with them? Because if you don't have understanding, the platform that should manifest you will become your greatest embarrassment. Sometimes they invite me for a meeting and I see the flyer, my heart start beating. Because the people you see on the platform, in five minutes, they can shut the world down. And now know if it's better, you better begin to look for an excuse not to go for that meeting. Because the height of that platform is out there either to glorify you or to disgrace you. What you know is what to translate to your glory. Imagine you say you are a businessman and they invite you to go for a conference. And then you see the flyer, you see Cosmos Maduka. You see people like Elon Musk on that flyer. What will you say? It's not about billion yet. You don't have a billion dollar. No problem. But what do you know? Can you talk where they are talking? Because the money is one thing, but the understanding is another. Assume they think you have the money. Maybe they saw your packaging and they assume that you have the money. You say you are a leader. They now invite you for a conference and you see Barack Obama. They say you people will address the people for 40, 40 minutes. That 40 minutes will become a lifetime. Because when Obama is done talking, when they call you, you will run. Daria will start. You will run. You will run. Now, if you want to be great and fruitful, that's how you think. Whatever it is they know, they don't have two heads. I will find it and I will know it. So that when I talk, somebody will be blessed. Look at the scriptures very quickly. Let me show you one or two verses. These are laws that govern productivity. See, there are places you go to because you stood there. Your life can change. But for you to stand there, you must know something. This thing is not a gift. The world, see, this system responds to what you know. This generation where you go on TikTok, you are seeing naked people. Your head is full of naked people. Everything is full of distraction. And you want to change a generation. A, a, an Arabian prince was talking recently and he said, if you find TikTok in China, all you will see on it is calculations and mathematical quiz and competition. It's only when you come to Africa that TikTok is about somebody naked. If you upload, if any of such thing is found in that country, you'll be jailed. Because they want their children to think mathematics. So there's a law around it. They know how this thing works. So when you're on the internet, you are learning. You are not there wasting time. Because the world will respond to what you know and your impact will be a function of what you know. Your fruitfulness is not a gift. It's a manifestation of the extent to which you know. If you don't know, you can't have impact. Genesis 41 verse 39. Joseph was in Egypt for at least 17 years of his life. When he came, in the prison alone, he was there for about 14 years. Nothing changed about his life. One moment before Pharaoh, he spoke and Pharaoh said, as, as much as God has shown you these things, he said, there is none as discreet and wise as thou art. The next verse will shock you. One encounter because of knowledge 
See how he catapulted the man. He said, thou shalt be over my house. The question is, how about those who were working with Pharaoh for 30 years? They don't know as much as Joseph knows. So Pharaoh will not put you in charge of his house out of sentiment. He said, you will be in charge of my house and according unto thy word shall all the people be ruled. How about your cousin, sir? How about your uncle? How about your auntie? It takes knowledge to rule. If I give the country to my uncle, we will die. The starvation will wipe out Egypt. So I love my uncle. I can send him monthly allowance. But if he has to do with ruling Egypt, he's the most discreet and wise person that will rule. He said, only in the throne will I be greater than you. What if his, his father's brother was alive? It doesn't matter. See, pursue knowledge. Understanding is a law in the spirit. The moment you know, the door will open. The moment you know, productivity will become a byproduct. The reason you are struggling is not because the devil is powerful. The reason you are struggling is because you are ignorant. The moment knowledge comes, even the devil can be uprooted. Bishop David Oedepo said something. He said, there are no mountains anywhere. He said, every man's mountain is his ignorance. And if you think it's a lie, try it. Improve your understanding and see the way the world will respond to you. Nobody should struggle. Every area of struggle is an alarm system that ignorance is locking. The moment you replace ignorance with knowledge, you will discover that doors will begin to open. Because for those who are enjoying open doors, it's not because they love them. It's because of what they know. I'm not here in this conference because I'm loved. I'm here in this conference, respectfully speaking, because God's servant felt I have something to tell you. If I don't have anything to tell you, this is a very senior minister. Before you book an appointment, you must have something to say. If you make the mistake of assuming, see, see our generation, people are, are buying cream. Their skin is glowing. They are in saloon. Eyelashes is sharp like razor blade. <laughs> Nobody cares about your eyelashes if it has to do with rulership. Your skin can glow, you'll be a bodyguard. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a bodyguard. Your skin can glow, you will be a cleaner. Everybody who has a place on the table came with value. It's not your skin they used to recruit you. It's your certificate. What do you know? That's what they are seeing. If you don't have something, if you don't have understanding, sir, you will go nowhere. And the problem is that we are not investing energy where it matters. Is it wrong to have a good haircut? No. Is it wrong to have good skin? No. Is anything wrong in dressing well? No, it's nothing wrong. Everybody should do that. It's part of excellence. However, if there's nothing in your head, that looks is a waste. He said, because you are wiser and more discreet, it's a rule over Egypt. Not because I know you by blood. Not because I love you. Not because you are my relative. I don't even know where you came from. It was many years later that Joseph came to him and said, I'm from Israel. My father is suffering somewhere. They are coming. Eh? You have a father? Okay, bring them. So the man didn't know where he came from. His background was not a factor. Knowledge covered for it. Before you go and meet the person, some people will enter your office and greet you with your language first. Or Gaza. If you don't know anything, language won't help. It will not help. You enter an office where a system is working. You come. You say, eh, Sanu, sir. Eh, Sanu, what do you know? Anya, Anya, what do you know? I have responded to your greeting. What do you know? This office is not running by language. It's running by understanding. Understanding. It's a law in the spirit. If you want to be fruitful, know something. And be the best in what you know. This is why as touching knowledge, you don't rest until the day you live here. You keep learning every day. Because the key to the next door is the understanding you acquired. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 20, the Bible said, Daniel and his friends, they were ten times better than all their peers. In every question, the king asked them. They were ten times better. So Daniel didn't stand out because he was a prophet. Daniel stood out because he was ten times better. This is a generation of titles. Apostle, professor, this. <laughs> when you finish gathering all the titles, your generation is interested in what you have to offer. It's not your title that moves them. 
there's nothing wrong with titles. If that's what God used to define your calling, that's fine. But you must have something. Daniel was not distinguished because he was a prophet. In fact, he was not even called a prophet in that, in that scripture. But his knowledge stood him out. He said he was ten times. The moment the king asked questions and they were answering, he now went back. Who are these boys? They said they are Hebrew boys. <sighs> Much later, we now heard that the king wanted to make him president over all the realms. Not because he loved him, but because the guy had understanding. See, if people love you, thank God for it. There are few people who will love you genuinely. In fact, if you find people who love you, value them. Do everything to keep that relationship. But over and above love, make sure you are relevant. Because in the day that they stop loving you, they will still keep you because they have no choice. If all they have towards you is love, they have a choice. The day that love goes down, they will kick you out. But if you have value, if you know something that their life depends on, they will hate you, but they will still work with you. They will come and quarrel and still use you. If you go, they will look for you and say, please come back. A proud man can beg you if you are indispensable. That's how this life works. He was ten times better. A point came in Daniel 5.11 when the kingdom was in disarray. There was no Israelite to speak on behalf of Daniel. It was the queen that came to endorse Daniel. He said, there is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He said, light and understanding is in this man and he has the ability to explain hard sentences. Those were his credentials. So every height you saw Daniel attain in Babylon, this is why. Excellent spirit, wisdom, ability to explain hard sentences. So when there is a problem, they look for you. That means what opens doors for you is problem. Everywhere there is crisis, they say, well, you may not like this person, but he's the only person who knows it. So they will call you and they will say, uh, do this job. They may not even greet you when you come. That's not a problem. You know it. And because you know it, unendingly, you'll be productive. There is a man in thy kingdom. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. God put it in my heart this morning to strongly encourage you. Pay the price to gain knowledge. You need understanding. You can be young, you can be old. Please know something. And don't just know anything. Know something that is relevant. Productivity resonates on understanding. It's a law in the spirit. Number three, the third law is the law of diligence. Diligence. Some people know so much, but they are not careful. So they are the ones who can solve the hardest problems. But every time they solve a problem, there's a careless thing they do that wastes and destroys what they have done. And so if you have understanding, but you don't have diligence, you will still have a problem. This is why some of the greatest surgeons can forget surgical blade in somebody's stomach. He is the one who can do the operation, but he can forget a blade. So in addition to understanding, the third law that makes you fruitful is the law of diligence. Listen, be detailed. Pay attention to what you do. Be careful. These things are hard, but these are the things that make you stand out. Some people are so careless that even the shirt they wear, they can't iron it. They sweat on the shirt yesterday, they wear it today. They sit near you, you can't breathe. Some even forget to brush their teeth. And they want to talk more than everybody. They start with people and they are talking. And you are talking, they say, yes, you are right. You are, well done, well done. And the guy thinks he's knowledgeable. No, you are not knowledgeable. You want to kill people. So they are, you are, yes, we agree, we agree. Whatever this man says is true. Yes, and they go. Because you can't brush. Some can't even comb their hair. You look at somebody, he is going to a conference. Ties hanging somewhere. He couldn't put his belt where. And the lace of shoe is running everywhere. And he, he arrives. He's as if the whole world is on his shoulder. Even if you are the best, it will be a risk to entrust it to you. It will be a big risk. So diligence is a law. If you will be fruitful, if you will be relevant, if you will be indispensable, you must pay the price to be diligent. And it begins, that's why one of the principles of leaders of the world is to change the world, change your bedroom first. They say a man who cannot dress his bed cannot change the world. 
So before you talk about global challenges, they will weigh you. Who is talking? If you are not kept, you can't keep the world. The world is too complex for you. If your bedroom is too complex for you to keep, it's not, you can't do anything about the world. That's why you begin with the little things before you handle the big things. It's a law of diligence. If you are not diligent, you can't prosper. And I show you some scriptures. Proverbs 22, 29. It says, Seest thou a man, popular scripture, diligent in his business. He said, They will stand before kings, not before men. men. Listen, these are universal laws. I'm starting with universal laws before I come into spiritual laws. Because if you do the spiritual laws and you don't know the universal law, it will still not profit you. Seest thou a man? He didn't say, seest thou a Christian. He didn't say, seest thou a tongue talker. Do you know today that bish some bishops employ Muslims to do some work? Because they are the only one who know it. Carry a tongue talking person. You will be in church in the middle of service. Generator will shut down. And the person will come and, and lie down and say, I'm sorry, man, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It's not about sorry. You have messed up the service. And when you check, they say, we didn't buy fuel. Hey, we, we wanted to buy fuel. We thought we would buy. You didn't buy fuel. You had the whole night and you didn't get fuel. That's the flimsy excuse some people give. They edit video to put online and they forgot to put the title of the message. Video is already online. Sometimes you give a direct instruction. Remove this, remove this. They now uploaded it in a hurry. And when 20,000 people have seen it. He now comes and says, sorry, sir. <laughs> when you finish crying, pack your load, you are sacked. <laughs> the world does not run on, I'm sorry. The world run on, I can do it well. If you don't do it well, you will be sacked. That's the problem. See us down. You know why it says, a diligent man stands before kings? Kings don't have time for nonsense. Because king size errors cannot be forgiven. So it takes diligence to stand there. How many serious people do you think they are? They say eh, they are quick to apologize. They can save you. And many people have turned apology to their lifeline. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In one day you are. I'm sorry. Thirty times. Yes, you are forgiven, but you are in the wrong place. Find where I'm sorry works. Not here. Because what you are doing is affecting millions of people. It's called diligence. Any man who does not have diligence does not have a future. Careless with everything. Careless. And he wants to be productive. He can't work like that. Most of the biggest equipments in the world, their major problems are tiny knots. To show you how important the small things are. And any man who is diligent understands the significance of the small things. And because he can pay attention to the small things, he can also do the big things. It's a law in the spirit. In Proverbs 10, 4, the Bible said, A slack hand makes poor. It said, But the diligent hand makes rich. When a man becomes diligent, he cannot but be productive. In Matthew 25, verse 23, Jesus told us the parable of the talent. The master gave five to one, two to the other, one to the other you'll be shocked that the one with the smallest coin is the careless one. The ones that had more were the ones who paid attention. And you know what Jesus kept telling them? Good and faithful servant. That was the credential. Good and faithful. They paid attention to details. And they did what they were supposed to do. So what he was rewarding was not the gain they made. It was their faithfulness. That's what Jesus was rewarding good and faithful servant. The last one that was not faithful, he said the one he has should be taken from him and given to the one that had more and wanted to have. So, the reason you find many people reducing to nothing is because they are not diligent. When God wants to test you with greatness, it starts with small. He gives you something small to see how you handle it. You want to be a pastor of 20 people, of 50 people, of 100 people, but they gave you one soul to follow up. And they asked you three months later, where is that brother that uh, we say you should take care of? You say, which brother is that? They now remind you, you say, Kai, uh, after the first week, I tried to reach him, but I don't know. Maybe I will check tomorrow. You can't keep one soul, and you want God to entrust you with 50. 
the brother they entrusted you with, you are now looking for it for him with the person who gave you. Some people are small as key. Give them car key, keep it there. Come back two hours later. Where is the key? They say, which key is that? No, there's something in your head that needs to come out because if you can't take care of key, then you may never have a house. Because a slack hand makes poor. A diligent hand make it rich. It's a law. Proverbs 12, 12, 24. It says the hand of the diligent bears rule. When a man becomes diligent, God deliberately puts authority and influence on him so that he can rule. The hand of the diligent. The Bible says, bears rule. I'm showing you why many are poor, many are small, and many are unproductive. And when they see people who are doing well, they say, Kai, God has helped this man. So you, God, is not helping you. If God does not help you, will you survive? They say, see these lucky people. See these lucky people. So you think people are making impact by luck. If this life is based on luck, do you know how many people are on earth? There are over 7.73 billion people. Even if luck were to happen in one hour, it will take a thousand years before it reaches somebody by probability. You say luck? Nobody is succeeding by luck. Everybody making impact has diligence in his life. I was up at 3 a.m. this morning putting this message together. Meanwhile, I preached yesterday and left here. I can tell you that 80% of the people hearing me here were asleep before 12. I was up by 3 a.m. And me who came here to preach to you, if I tell you my schedule in the last two weeks, you will shout. I was in Abiyokuta two weeks ago. I left Abiyokuta. I flew straight, came to Abuja and flew straight to Cameroon. I went, as I landed Douala, I drove seven hours to Bamenda, preached there, and drove another six hours to Yaoundé, preached, before I returned to Nigeria after three days of preaching. As I came to Nigeria, I preached in, in the church that Tuesday evening. Wednesday, Thursday, I was in Fota and ministered. And that's how I've been ministering. Before coming here, I was in family worship center. And I'm here today. This evening, I will still preach in church. The question is, which message will I preach? And it's on the go. That's how it is. And then somebody looks at you and says, Ah, these young men are lucky. See the way God is helping them. You are joking. <laughs> if I tell you, I don't know when I went to bed before 2 a.m., you won't believe it. That one can't happen again. It will be difficult to catch me sleeping before 2 a.m. So when people are sleeping, that's when our day begins. Because if you want to lead others, you must be awake when they are sleeping. You wake up, you went and did work two hours, you say, Kai, man must work. This life no easy. You. <laughs> These are, I'm talking universal laws before I enter spiritual laws. Because most of us know only spiritual laws, we don't know universal laws. Most of these are our fathers that you see making impact. Go and check their schedule. They are in their 70s, but they are awake when you are sleeping. If you know how many things they control to stay where they are, you are wondering, what kind of thing is this? Because they have, like Paul, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. I beat my body. I beat it. Because if I allow my body, I will be sleeping. If, if it were for what I want, I should be sleeping now. There are times when you are moving, your body is sleeping, you say, wake up. This is not time. There is work to do. Bishop Oedepo said, somebody ask him, when do you rest? He said, when the job is done. <laughs> and there is a law for rest. I will talk about it. But I am telling you, only rest when you have done the work. Because some people are not resting. They are lazying around. And it's because they don't pay the price of diligence. Work is left undone. They say they are tired. The hand of the diligent makes rule. You want to be productive, you must be diligent. All these people who sing music, you see everybody talking about it. Check how many hours they spent in studio to do one. It's not this one that you were watching. You say, ah, this song has come. This song has come. And then you write a song, you sing it. No one now, it's only 10 people that heard it. And out of the 10, 8 are your family members. 
Hey, a, a song just came. Which song came? If you know how many hours of investment enter the song that they sing before everybody is singing it everywhere, you say, Ah, this person is so anointed. See the anointing. You, are, you don't know how many. Go to the studio. Some of them are there for three weeks every day. As they are singing it, they are fine tuning. They are fine tuning until they finally release it. It's diligence. Even in the process of releasing, they build the publicity stone. Create expectation towards it. All of those things are carefully done. You don't just wake up and say, on the 25th, I will release the song. No. What have you put on ground? You see people organize crusade, a crowd gather. You think, they say, God sent me to this land. I will come and take it. You are, it's a joke. If you know the nitty gritties that go down, the attention that they pay to it, you'll be shocked. Because you can make one mistake, it will wreck the whole ministry. One mistake, it will shut it down. Sometimes we are preaching, I'm preaching, and under that atmosphere, intensity, I say some things that I don't have the authority to say. Before the service is over, the media people have locked it. After service, they pull it down. Because if you hear that one thing, and you look at who said it, if it's E.A. Adebowi that said it, it's okay. Is it this, this, this tiny person? The ministry will go down. So you must be diligent. You who is preaching, you are paying attention. The people who are working are paying attention because he has to, there must be precision. This is why many are not productive because they are careless about life, careless about destiny. Diligence is a law. The fourth law is the law of opportunity. Not everything works at every time. A man who is fruitful must know when to do what. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible said, oh my God, see, pattern your life after these things. Oh. He said, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. If you miss opportunities, you will labor. You must have known the difference between Kronos time and Kairos time. You can use nine months to prepare. If you miss one hour, that nine months can be wasted. That's the power of the opportune time. The opportune time is so short that many miss it. So they are doing the same thing in the last 15 years because their opportune time comes after four years. And demons too are smart. They may not bother about you going to church every day for nine months, fasting and praying. But when it's October, you must fall into immorality. And you don't know that they have studied your cycle. They know that your encounters come in October. So you can fast every day for nine months. All the demons are waiting for October. The moment is October first. Somebody will call you. Ah, are you still alive? You have forgotten me. You say, who is this? He said, ah, ah, it's a big girl now. Ah, a big girl. From where? Ah, ah, we met in Anambra. Oh, you are about to destroy nine months of fasting. In two weeks, everything you say, Abigail, we agree. Abigail, we agree to meet you anywhere. And you send money. Abigail shows up. You go and fornicate. You come back and say, Oh Lord, my God, oh, help me. You will cry. Nine months have gone. He will forgive you, but you will start the cycle next year. And that's how the devil has kept some people in one spot for 15 years. Because they do everything right in the Kronos time, but they miss the Kairos time. The law of productivity is that you must get it right at your Kairos time. If you miss it, the harvest will be destroyed. That's why many go nowhere. They don't know the power of opportunity. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it said, The sons of Isaacar, they had understanding of times and seasons and knew what Israel ought to do. He said, the heads of them were 200. All their brethren were at their commandment. You want to dominate this world, you must not miss your season. If you miss your season, there is problem. All your effort and labors will be in vain. That's why you keep crying, oh God, I've done this thing for four years. I'm praying every day. You didn't discern your Kairos moment. You didn't discern your opportune moment. Your whole manifestation is credited into the opportune time. If you get it right, then you justify the labor of the last 10 years. In Genesis 8, 20 to 22, after Noah offered clean beasts to God, he said God spoke in his heart. 
He said, I will no more destroy the earth because of man. And God showed us how these things work. He said, as long as, go to verse 22. Why the earth remaineth? So long as we are on earth, so long as this thing is called earth, he says, seed time and harvest. Notice something in that snow time. It is when you plant. So, so there is a time that controls other times. Seed time and harvest shall not cease. So many people don't know the time that matters. And they miss that time and they are struggling at every other time. If you miss the time that matters the most, every other labor is a waste. So there is the law of opportunity. You must discern it and you must walk in it. In John chapter 5 verse 4, the Bible speaking from verse 3 said, There was by the pool market, by the sheep market, a pool called Bethesda. And he said, at a certain time, in verse 4, he said, the angel of the Lord came and troubled the waters. He said, whoever gets in first is cleansed of whatsoever. So your problem, as far as that pool is concerned, is not the matter. It's your ability to discern the staring tower and to step in. You can imagine that a man was there for 38 years. He was not meant to be there for 38 years. He was there for 38 years because he couldn't discern the opportune time. So the reason that crisis is lasting and subsisting is not because the devil is strong. It's not because the problem is too big. The reason many are barren is not because things are too hard. Yes, things are hard in Nigeria. But if one person is succeeding, it means you too must insist to succeed. And most times, the reason many don't make it is because they waste the opportune time. When you should be studying, that's when you became creative that, oh, there are nightclubs in Abuja on Friday. And then every Friday you are driving. When your orders are going for VG, during the week people are studying, that's when you discover, oh, there's a cinema. And you use the season of study for cinema. And then when you are 35, you come and say, this life no fail. See the way things are. This government, this useless government. <laughs> And then your friends that labored when they should, you now get offended at them. Imagine, he has five cars. He can't even dash anybody one. What kind of friend is that? See, see, he has money. Every day, he's planting it. I went to Dubai. I went to London. So what should we do? Go to her. When you finish your bitterness, wake up. You are eating the fruit of your labor. It's not your friend's responsibility to feed you. And some people will go to ritualists and, and do chant to kill their friends. He is wicked. I imagine. I went to beg him for one million. He didn't give me. And the next day, I saw him in a lunching. He gave ten million. <laughs> he can give hundred million in a lunch if he wants to. It is not indebted to you. You have your responsibility to yourself to build yourself. You find other sisters who are serving God, trusting God to help them, keeping their virtue, keeping their lives. You were clubbing, going everywhere. You were, when time came to marry, you who was the diva, suddenly you are now looking for husband. Meanwhile, when God was telling you what to do, you did it. And then you come now, you say, there are no men. There are many men. But men find wives, not ladies. He said, he who finds a wife. You don't become a wife when you are married. You become a wife to be found. And in the last five years, you didn't train yourself to be a wife. So even, the, even if the man sees you, God will hide his face to protect his destiny. I'm telling you, this realm is governed by laws. Don't miss your opportunity. Know what you should do, when you should do it. And discipline yourself to do it. Because the outcome of your future depends on it. Today you find some people at the age of 80, they are going to the farm. My son, help me. What were you doing when you were 25? What were you doing when you were 30? I know there are people that calamity befell. And please hear this. If you find an elderly person, help them. It's not in your place to judge them. But I'm telling young people now, so that you don't get to 80 and find yourself there. How can you be begging at the age of 70? What did you do with the first 60 years of your life? 
wasted opportunities wasted and so there's no productivity i don't know who god is talking to this morning i'm a revivalist i do a lot of fire ministration but this has just been the burden of my heart because we are talking about fruitfulness listen if you become wise you will not allow any opportunity to pass you by in fact, the proof of wisdom is your ability to discern windows of opportunity and maximize them. That's the proof of wisdom. You discern windows of opportunity and you maximize them. There are some windows that all you need to do is to greet respectfully. There are some other windows that all you need to do is to lend the helping hand. There are some other windows that all you need to do is to be rightly positioned. And you will discover that it will change the next 10 years of your life. But many don't discern opportunities. You go to a wedding. God sent somebody there to look for a wife. Meanwhile, at the time he turned to look at you, that's when you are, give me a loan. What is wrong? Ah, who is this Jezebel? You didn't know that when you are in a public place, anything can happen. When a man becomes wise, he discerns windows of opportunities and he maximizes them because your outcome to a very large extent, depends on the many opportunities that you have maximized. Number five is the law of favor. Now we are going a bit spiritual. For you to be productive, this thing called favor must rest on your life. I'm telling you, it must. See, one thing that you cannot do without is favor. No matter how diligent you are, no matter how much you maximize opportunities, if you check the story of your life, there must be gaps you cannot explain. If you can explain everything about your life, God is not involved. And that your success is not genuine, it will soon finish. It will soon fail. There must be gaps that you cannot explain. And the fillers of those gaps, number one, is favor. And so when a man is productive and impactful to a very large extent, there's favor on his life. And there are things that engender favor. Now, let me show you a few things. Israel was in Egypt in captivity for at least 400 years. And suddenly, hear what happened. God, in fact, before the captivity, Genesis 15 verse 14, God told Abraham. See what God told Abraham. He said, and also that nation, talking about the nation that will come out of it, because this was where God entered the covenant with Abraham. He said, whom they shall serve. That's the nation that Israel shall serve, Egypt. He said, I will judge. And afterwards, shall they come out with great substance. That's fruitfulness. God is telling Abraham, your children will serve a nation. I will judge that nation. And afterwards, they will come out with great substance. But the question is, by what means will they come out with great substance? You now go to Exodus chapter 3 verse 21. God now started talking to Moses. I will use authority to judge them, but it will take another commodity for them to come out with substance. He said, and I will give these people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when they go, they will not go empty. So it will take power to judge Egypt, but it will take favor to carry substance. Your enemies can be judged. A nation can be judged, but you will still be poor. This is why you cannot negate favor if you want to have plenty and abundance. In Exodus 12, 36, the Bible said, and God gave favor to the Israelites. And he said, they spoiled the Egyptians. In fact, in the verse before, he said, they went to them and asked them of gold and diamond. The question is, how can somebody who has been your slave all your life suddenly walk to your room and say, give me your gold? Are you mad? Is something wrong with your head? But you see, when favor is your life, protocol is suspended. When favor is your life, status quo is exonerated. That's why a slave can go to the master, give me that diamond, the one you use for your daughter's wedding, I need it. And the person brought it. That's the power of favor. You think you got the contract because you are the best? Maybe you should check the CVs that were submitted. If you saw them, you won't apply. Because you think you have experience. You came with 15 years experience. The person who is bidding that contract came with 40 years. You studied, you have a, a PhD, they have first class from Harvard. You, you know somebody, the president is his cousin. The reason they picked your contract is because something was speaking beyond the natural. 
and for those who will stand out, the supernatural must be superimposed. This is why those who are not in God, they know darkness. There are places they go with goats, they won't tell you. They know that there are invincible forces that control this realm. Even those who are not into idolatry, they know something about, you hear people talking about law of attraction. They are looking for different means to attract favor. So all these wealthy men, they are doing exercise and they say they are doing yoga meditation. You, don't, you think they don't know what they are doing. They tell you, we are not religious. Who told you? Everybody worships the spirit. Everybody. You can, you, you can modernize your own and call it yoga. I can keep my own traditional and come to church. All of us worship spirit because you must have favor. How do you think that Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook when it was nothing? He took over the world. He now created trade and he failed. That is to tell you that this thing is beyond intelligence. If favor is not credited, you can have the biggest name. You can do everything right and still fail. What he designed now should be superior to what he designed as a student. How come the one he designed as a student succeeded much more than the one he designed as an established global influencer? If you lack favor as a Christian, you will struggle. He said, because of favor, they came up. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 47. See why the children of God took over their world. You think they took over because they are apostles? There was favor given to them. He said they were praising God, having favor with all the people. And he said the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So their increase was a function of the favor that was upon their lives. The reason you try, you don't grow. You try, you don't prosper. Most times, favor is lacking. And there are systems that generate favor. One of the systems that generate favor is fasting. See, that's why when you tell Christians to do spiritual things, they don't. They are in trouble. When you fast, it creates favor over your life. In Esther chapter 4 verse 16, Esther said to Mordecai, Go and tell the people to take a fast for me. I too will fast for three days. And he said, afterwards, I will go to the king. If I perish, I perish. Because if you go to the king, when you are not invited, he will kill you. And Esther chapter 5 from verse 1, he said, when Esther came in, when it was not the time for her to come, he said, the king looked at her and found favor in her sight. And the king beckoned for her to come. And when Esther came, see what transpired in verse 3. This is somebody who is standing at the risk of being beheaded. So, and you know this king has this capacity he was organizing a banquet he called his wife come and dance and the wife didn't come that was the last day she saw him he stripped her of her status and immediately organized to marry another woman so this king has that capacity but Esther had done something that provoked favor in verse 3 said the king said unto her what will thou now a man asks you what do you want you have not answered the man now started answering for you Number one, he said, what is thy request? It shall be given. Thank God for the perfume you are using. I know your perfume is worth two million. But if that's all you spread on your body, you are in trouble. When you are going to enter a place where your destiny will be decided, in addition to perfume, carry the fragrance of favor. Carry it. Carry it. It will change your life. There are many things that engender favor. Kind words provoke favor. Kind words. Kind words. You see why some people talk arrogantly and carelessly. They don't know their mind, their own destiny. Kind words. As simple as it is. If you, if you want to be productive, my brother, my sister, you need a lot of favor. People won't receive you because you are the best. They will receive you because you are favored. Trust me, until Jesus comes, most of the best will be rejected. But there is no day a man who is favored will be rejected. Favor breaks protocols. Even royal protocols can be broken because of favor. And so if you want to be fruitful, make sure you obey the law of favor. Carry enough of it. It will change your story forever. Israel became mighty by favor. Esther saved the whole of Israel by the power of favor. Productivity is tied to favor. Law number six is the law of the blessing. Everybody who is prospering on earth was blessed. I'm telling you. In Genesis 1.28 when we read, before God told them be fruitful, he said, and the Lord blessed them. 
If you don't bless them, they cannot be fruitful no matter how hard working they are. Hard work is good, but the most hard working people are not the richest people. And if you think it's a lie, go to where they are building. The people who work the hardest are those who are carrying blocks and sand. When they mix one, one pan, they say it's their 40 naira or 80 naira. Meanwhile, the engineer shows up and says, okay, uh, do this, do this, do this, do that. And he goes away. He is earning over a thousand times more than what all of them are earning put together. He worked hard in the university, but now he's talking. So hard work is good, but in addition to hard work, my brother, you need something else. There is a blessing. He said, the blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich and added no sorrow to it. So you must make sure that you carry a blessing on your life. There is a blessing we receive from the gospel, but in addition to that, there are systems and authorities that God put in place to bless us. This is why you cannot despise any channel through which there is a blessing. Your parents, elders in society, and spiritual authorities. When the devil wants to rob a generation, he teaches them rebel rebellion. And so you find many children disobedient to parents. She walks to the house and says, Mom, wash the plate. I just make my fingers. I can't wash. Really? You are learned. You are civilized. So your mother, who took who gave birth to you, she will cook, you eat, she will pack the plate and wash it. And if mommy wants to talk, say, come on, mom, what's this? Your mother is afraid of you. You will die young. That's your gift. That's your gift. God has a gift for such people. You will die young. And if you escape young death, your children will torment you. So you have raised a curse in your bloodline. Any system that blesses, listen, when people rebel and despise them, keep quiet. I'm telling you, this generation, the devil is mentoring us to attack systems that bless. From parents to spiritual authority. And you think we know something. Revelation. Revelation. And you find somebody stands up, he's attacking somebody that has served God for 30 years. Listen, all men make mistakes. When those who have labored for God make mistakes, pray for them. I'm not saying endorse them. I'm not saying validate their errors. And there are certain errors that can affect the body of Christ. If you have authority over people, correct them to avoid it. But never find yourself in a position where you are rebelling against systems that bless. This kingdom is a relay race. It says without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Without every contradiction, there's no argument in this matter. If you want to be productive in this life, you must always stay under the blessing. Because it is the blessing that causes you to prosper. The word blessed means empowered to prosper. I can tell you, different junctions of my life, God used men to shift me. Only God makes men. Very true. Let us make man. But God has many channels. And one of the channels God uses to make men are channels of other men to bless them. The, don't you see how the patriarchs preserved Israel? Abraham wants to die. He said they gave gifts to the sons of Keturah. He said, but to Isaac he gave the blessing. Isaac wants to die. Genesis 27. He calls Esau. Go and get for me a savory venison. Let me eat and my soul will bless you. I don't bless you by talking. There's something I carry. I transfer it. And when Jacob disguised and came as Esau from verse 27. Hear the way this guy was talking. By this With so much audacity and authority. Christ, so that Look at Genesis 27, 27. He said, and when he came near and kissed him and he smelled and smelled his raiment and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son smells of a field which the Lord has blessed. He turned the guy to be a field. From that moment, he stopped being an individual. He became a harvest ground. So anybody that comes to Jacob will be blessed. That's why Laban said, I've come to understand by divination, God bless me because of you. Because Jacob has become a field. Anybody can eat from him. Go to the next verse, verse 28. He said, therefore God give thee the dew of heaven. So the guy walked under open heaven perpetually. From that day, there's nothing like desert in the life of Jacob. Anywhere he goes, there's abundance. How can a man be like this just because somebody spoke? 
He said, and the fatness of the earth and the plenty of corn and wine. In, verse, in the next verse, he said, your brothers will bow to you. He made him the firstborn by talking, by talking. Because blessings make men. When the devil wants to kill you, he will deny you and cut you off the channels of blessing. It's a law. Every institution and every individual that should be a blessing in your life, make sure you pay the price of honoring them. He say, honor your father and your mother. Even if they don't say anything, he say, your days will be long on earth. So your father doesn't even need to say, live long. Just honor them. You have activated the law. He said, without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. When you honor any system, there's a gradient. Oil begins to flow. That blessing will make you. That's what will bring value to your labors. There are many persons laboring, they are wondering, I've done what they said to do. Why is it not working? Sometimes, the blessing is lacking. It's a law. There are nine laws. I've taught six. I will stop here. The other three, I will mention them so that you know them. The seventh law is the law of the outpouring. Everywhere the Holy Ghost rests, there is prosperity. In Isaiah 32 verse 15, the Bible said, until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. He said, the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field becomes a forest. That's why every time there is revival, there is explosion in prosperity. Even in the Acts of the Apostles, the Bible said there was none among them that lacked. The moment the Holy Ghost is poured forth, productivity becomes natural. Fruitfulness becomes natural. This is why you cannot allow yourself to be dry at any time. At all times, make sure the move of the Spirit is on your life. Prayer, fasting, waiting upon the Lord, all of these things provokes the outpouring. You see the apostles when they were flogged, the Bible said they went to their own company. They prayed. The place where they were was shaking and they were filled with the Holy Ghost again. Acts 4 from verse 28. And it said, with great power, God bore witness to the resurrection of Christ. Great grace was upon them. And it said, those who were possessors of land, possession has come in. Told them, brought the proceeds, none amongst them lacked. When there's an outpouring, there's abundance. You just keep multiplying. Even the souls were multiplying. Acts 2, 41, 3,000 was added. Acts 4, verse 4, 5,000 was added. Acts 6, verse 7, the priests were, became subject to the faith. Acts 13, 44, the whole city went to them. A man can just keep enlarging so long as the Holy Ghost is being poured forth. So every time you become dry, know that it will affect your money. I'm telling you, as a preacher, if I go on a retreat for seven days, I'm not preaching. No. Sometimes what comes to me is more than what I have when I travel around. You are indoors as you are praying, God is touching people's heart. You come out and somebody calls you, please, I'm led to do this. I'm led to do that. You say, ah, but I'm not walking. No, sometimes it's not by walking. You run faster when you wait. Because that's where the outpouring is. Law number eight is the law of prophecy. When prophecy comes, I told you yesterday, even dry bones can become a great army. Ezekiel 37, you see that? A valley of dry bones. He said the bones were dry. He said, but I prophesied as I was commanded. And dry bones became an army. That's the power of prophecy. Prophecy is powerful. Listen, one of the greatest blessings you get in the service is when the word is going forth. It may not be emotional. I know sometimes we love emotion. But listen, if that word came from God, it will change your story. Prophecy. I've seen the excellency of prophecy in my own life and on the lives of those who follow me. A brother drove to me. His car broke down on the road. He came and while he sat down, God told me I will lift him. And now stood up. You know, when you hear God, you become bold. I told him, do you believe in God? He said, oh, God is alive. <laughs> when you have struggled in Abuja for 12 years, you will answer carefully. <laughs> God is alive. I say, listen to me. 
in the next three months, you will not know yourself. The difference between what you are now and what you'll be will be like night and day. The guy say, Pastor, I go come back home. If it no work, I say, if it doesn't work, I'm not called. He left me in two months. He bought two cars. On the third month, he bought a duplex. When he came back to me, he was laughing. He said, hmm. now wow, apostle, apostle. Somebody who looked at me in the face and said, Pastor, I will come back. They now say, Apostle. When I say, how are you? He knelt down to shake me. Okay, I know he has seen something. You know, people don't respect you because of how you look. It's what your words did to their life that provoke respect. He moved from pastor to apostle. How? Ah, yes, sir. Now, if I say, where are you? He said, my, my boss, do you need anything? He will rush down. Not because I'm powerful, but I heard God. If you want to be productive, you must hear God. The prophetic word comes as you hear. You speak as you are commanded. If you can hear and say, your life will change forever. I'm telling you, if you can hear and say. Second Kings 7, 1 Kings 7.1 A nation was besieged. Women were eating their children. And you know on earth, the purest love is between a mother and a child. That's the most unconditional love that exists. In fact, when the Bible is talking about love, it uses a mother and child as an example. Will a mother forget her suckling child? But women were eating their children and the prophet spoke, by this time tomorrow, a cup of barley will be sold for one shekel. The prime minister said, I know about the window of heaven, but it's not possible. And he said, you will see it, you will not eat it. And in one day, the national economy turned. And unless God does not speak, if he speaks, the earth can be in darkness. A new earth can appear. That's the power of prophecy. Listen, when God is speaking, don't treat it casually. Learn to believe and to receive prophecy. Your life will change. And the last law is the law of rest. No matter how hardworking you are, you must spend time to rest. Otherwise, you will die before you harvest. The Bible said, even God rested. Genesis 2 verse 2. It says, and God rested from all his works. So you walk and then you rest. Don't rest before you walk. Walk and then what? Rest. So that you can be refreshed to do more. If you know these laws, your life will go from one level.